thank you so much for doing this. Um, yeah, this podcast is about you and your journey in music, and uh, we'll talk about your brand new record coming out, The Fray. And I yeah. love the little trailer that you guys put together. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, thanks well, for having well, me. Yeah, of course. Where, where where were you born and raised? I was born in Essex. Okay. In, on, right on the border of uh, East London and Essex in a in a little hamlet called Barking. Okay. And I lived there for about six months before my parents moved us to St. Albans. My dad's career was starting to take off. He was a a record industry man. Oh, he, really? Yeah, he he was the marketing director of Pinnacle, one of the big classical labels. Wow. And yeah, and so he was uh, he was doing really well. You know, he he bought a nice big house in St. Albans, and then things progressed and he became the marketing director of Naxos, which is now the biggest classical label in the world. That's but, amazing. Yeah. And then his business partner completely screwed him over oh. just, just after my dad had moved us down to Devon. So okay. having been within reach of London, within reach of his, his business life, he thought, We'll opt for a quiet life, raise the boys somewhere. My, my brother and I raise us somewhere a little more peaceful. Mm-hmm. So moved us down to Devon. And then a year into it, his business partner did him over, did him out of his business. And so my dad then was out of the record business and ended up circuitously running a taxi firm in this little town, a little fishing town on the very southernmost uh you know, part of England, Devon, Devon and Cornwall, where, where England kind of develops this funny little foot. Um, I I grew up in a little rocky fishing town down there. I lived there from the ages of four to nineteen. Okay. And uh, yeah, my dad. You know, there were there were year some lean years where he struggled to put food on the table, but he did it every night nonetheless. You know. Mm-hmm. For so sure. I, I was always wary of getting into the record business, and yet I was I gonna say, now look at you, now you're in a musician, but you never signed to yeah. a label, right? No, man. The first deal I ever signed was with Thirty Tigers in Nashville, and wow. that was that was in 2018. But until then, I'd, I'd never signed a record deal. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. obviously, I mean, I'm sure seeing that, you know, your dad's career and everything, was it was that kind of the reason why you didn't, or or yeah, was there I a think, reason behind it? Perhaps. Originally, yeah, I, I just felt like, well, having seen what happened to my dad when he when he trusted someone, and you mm-hmm. know, they, but again, I mean that that was that was because he hadn't signed a deal. Perhaps if he had signed a contract, he would have been a little more protected. I don't know. Oh, I, sure. I just I I feel um, when I'm working with someone, I want there to be a a, a sense of trust, mm-hmm. and I want to know that people are going to work as hard as I do, you know, because sure. I think I think you have to want to. I think you have to want to surround yourself with people who are going to work really bloody hard mm-hmm. in this in this game. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. And I never, I just never really found it. I never really found it. I never found a label partner who were willing to put in the legwork until I met David Macias and Sarah Silver and all at Thirty Tigers. Very that's cool. Been, that's been my home since, man. I feel very happy there. That's amazing. Well, yeah. with with your dad being involved in in classical music, what was what what was the first instrument you learned? Was it the piano? Yeah, yeah. I started learning piano when I was six. I had a piano teacher who used to dig her long nails into my fingers in back in the eighties <laughs> when you, when you could kind of when you could hit a kid. <laughs> when could, yeah, when when you could freely abuse children in the name of education. <laughs> in the good old days, um, I used to get my my fingers sort of pinned to the keyboard you're playing it wrong crunch oh and uh it really put me off playing the piano however i got to sort of competition level you know i have a i have a little plaque somewhere from i think i was eight and i won the sort of south devon piano championship wow and it was i can't remember what i played actually but you know i I got my i worked my way up through the grades and but it made music a fairly procedural experience. Whereas mm-hmm. in the house, you know, my dad was playing Ravel and Chopin and Bach and Beethoven, all of these individual mouthpieces of God, you know, just mm-hmm. extraordinary music in the house. And he and that was punctuated by B.B. King and Rai Kuda and Paul Simon. 
mm-hmm. and the Beatles and Aretha Franklin, you know. Sure. John Lee Hooker. I was, you know, <laughs> when I was eight years old, I knew who John Lee Hooker was. That and wow, I, that's and impressive. I, I thought I thought that was cool, but none of the my my um, so called friends in school were on my side. You know, sure, they, they were more interested in new kids on the block. Oh, okay, uh, so I, <laughs> so I, you know, I always had this very rich musical education at home, and when I picked up a guitar, I was eleven, and okay. it was a it was a joint influence of of having seen bill and ted's bogus journey <laughs> <laughs> so actually yeah so i guess i was maybe i was 12 it that steve Vai guitar finale where they they correct the course of history through dueling guitars oh yeah had a profound <laughs> effect on me man. I'm, I'm not joking i just thought wow okay guitar music can save the world i kind of knew this already because I've been listening to B.B. King. I know this to be true, but, mm-hmm. you know, and then there were some other kids in school who were like becoming quite popular because they played guitar. And I thought, actually, I, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. I was a kind of short, chunky comic book geek who <laughs> none of the girls would talk to, you know. And so I you thought, got the guitar. I thought, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I want to play guitar and I want to I want to be one of those guys. And the weird thing was, you know, as soon as I picked up the guitar, I felt at home. Uh-huh. I felt like I felt completely at peace and uh, like I was I remember very clearly just feeling like I belonged and it's a rare feeling you know for mm-hmm. a sort of you know a kid just verging on adolescence you mm-hmm. know, that feeling like you you found you found your path and it was powerful and profound and I locked myself away and played guitar all day and all night you know as soon as i got home from school till i went to bed and all weekend everything uh-huh. was just about guitar 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 do you, do you think it's because it was something that you chose also like whereas with piano you know your teachers forcing <laughs> you to play these songs like when, when you picked up guitar yeah. were you trying to learn uh, other people's songs or were you learning trying or trying to write your own songs like how how, how did yeah. you kind of get into guitar well, I, th- I think that's that is right. You know, it was my decision, so I I committed to it wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. My dad got me the Eric Clapton MTV Unplugged tablature book. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So because we were we used to watch that. We my dad got the VHS cassette tape, and we used to watch it. You know, every night I I became obsessed with Clapton Hendrix the way any young guitar player does, right? Sure. Because those are the very high priests of the church. Those mm-hmm. those are kind of the gods. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, yeah, I just, I started learning. I kind of learned guitar through uh, transcribing Eric Clapton Unplugged. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and when I told Eric, I met Eric Clapton a couple of years ago at a Transatlantic Sessions gig that I was playing. Wow. And, and, and he said, oh, do you know what? I, I don't even remember half of those tunes. <laughs> <laughs> well, his catalog yeah. is so extensive. You know, I always wonder yeah. that, like, Actually, yeah. somebody's. Ta- I was talking to somebody recently, and I didn't know this, but uh, Bruce Springsteen doesn't. He's never created a set list. Did you know mm-hmm. that? He just plays whatever he's feeling. And I mean, I feel like with a catalog as extensive as his, yeah, I didn't know that. How would you ever just like? And I somebody was telling me he'll like take requests, and it's like some you know obscure like album cut, and he'll know how to play it. Like I was just, I find that fascinating with artists like Eric Clapton, where yeah, I don't remember how to play those. I haven't played that song in thirty years or whatever, you know. Yeah, that's, that's why the that's why the E Street Band always looks so edgy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> I, I know a million songs. <laughs> yeah, man, I saw him at Glastonbury, and I was, I was, I remember thinking, how does he keep it like he's making it look so fluid? <laughs> and actually, it's right. It's because he's just thinking of it off the cuff. Yeah, he just does it off the top of his head, which is is just so mind-blowing yeah it's ex- that's pretty extraordinary I, I only started writing the set lists about six seven years ago and when i did i found it really helped actually oh really so you used to just go <laughs> up and play yeah, whatever came to, to your head yeah i used to make it up and then as soon as i bought a band on board i think because i i don't necessarily have the budget to um you know pay a band enough to rehearse to the point where they can just <laughs> Yeah, you know, go move, do whatever move, you whatever <laughs> you want to play. <laughs> yeah. My bass, my bass player. I tried it a couple of times, and my bass player said, "Look, mate, 
you have to write a set list or I'm I'm out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I guess I'll have <laughs> right, to do yeah, that. Yeah, I suppose you do need to know what, <laughs> what I'm planning. That's fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, so you get this guitar, you become obsessed. Do you start writing and performing as a solo artist at this point or... Uh, did oh, that, you start to form a band or what, yeah, where did your music I got into some begin? bands first, you know, me, okay. me, and, me and my mates in Devon, we, you know, around the age of 17, I got to the point where, cause I hated school. <laughs> I mean, hated it. And, uh, I, you know, I was a sort of perennial outsider, mercilessly bullied by all of the, I suppose in America, you'd call them jocks, you know, oh, yeah. all the sort of big meaty sporty guys. Yeah. The meatheads. Just, they, yeah, they just, used to, <laughs> just used to kick my head in once. Oh a week. man! So, as and then as soon as I pick, I started, you know, playing guitar. I I sort of got to the point where I was playing it. You know, I'd go out on like on the grass outside the school and play my guitar in the summer, and, and girls kind of sit around you and like listen to you sing. And then and then I it was weird at that at that point I stopped getting bullied. I thought, oh okay. <laughs> the guitar yeah. is kind of the guitar's kinda of working. <laughs> and when I when I went to college, I met other other guys, other boys who had figured out that crucial lesson in uh, you know, in musical <laughs> in <education>. high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Become become decent at an instrument and life will life will kind of open up. <laughs> so we formed a band, you know, and we started playing mm-hmm. covers, we started busking around the towns and um playing in pubs and we were just playing Mm -hmm. covers man like we were you know we were i was fortunate to come up in in the late 90s listening to reef and pearl jam and nirvana and you know all the really really good guitar bands so we were we had a kind of a rough approximation of uh of a set list of the kind of greatest hits grunge grunge covers (laughs) yeah man and and, you know (laughs) Yeah, we, we, we just kind of, we did our best and it and it was probably terrible, but we had a really good time. And, you know, we we made a, enough money from a gig to go and have a few beers and it was a good time. But then I went off to university in Liverpool and moving to Liverpool kind of changed my life again. You know, mm-hmm. I moved to a place where there were, where there were lots and lots of people from lots of different towns around the UK and around Europe. There were some canadians and americans at the university as well all the kind of all the people who had maybe become you know they felt they were pretty proficient at their instrument in their small town were then thrown thrown together in a college environment Mm -hmm. and you realize okay right i'm not i'm not that great at all you know there's a lot of practice to be done here yeah did you went to school for music yeah i went to a university in liverpool yeah uh, okay I've heard that from people that went to like Berkeley, like, yeah. oh yeah, you know, you're the best guitar player in your town and you show <laughs> up and you're with every best guitar player in their town. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly there's another better guitar player. Yeah. And another did you one and like one. audition to get into the, to the university? I did. Yeah. Cause I didn't have any grades. I was a terrible student, you know, Okay. I discovered, <laughs> I discovered, um, well, around the time that I was 17 and studying for my a levels which qualify you for university in the uk mm-hmm. I, I also discovered marijuana ah and, there you go <laughs> yeah and I, and I found that i i enjoyed listening to records and smoking dope more than i did studying for exams sure and, but then around that time i also got seriously ill i i uh suffered meningitis b so i i found myself oh, in a coma three weeks before i turned 18 and uh, oh my gosh yeah and then so i my exams just suffered completely. I walked out. I I did the kind of the easy subjects. I did um, theater studies, communication studies, and music technology. The ones where it's okay to be a bit stoned and not really listen. Right. That's why I got my and, degree in communications. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I still failed my exams. Oh, like so, math, no thanks. <laughs> you know, physics. I mean, I you know yeah, I like no now that I'm in my thirties, I like reading about physics. But back then, I you know not a right. chance. You actually had to show up for that. <laughs> right. So, right. yeah, I, I I flunked out. And I so I went and did an audition in Liverpool at Paul McCartney's Liverpool Institute for Performing wow. Arts. And they took me in based on the strength of my playing and, and a couple of songs that I'd written, I, you know, quote unquote songs. Oh, um, so you you performed your own originals. It wasn't yeah, like, okay, play was, this, you know, <laughs> riff or whatever. <laughs> no, it was just like show us show us what you're made of. So I I kind of showed them what I was what I'd been working on, and they uh-huh. they, they took me on. Excuse me, I'm just putting my socks on. Oh no worries. Um, and uh, 
yeah and i got in and then you know i met all of these other best musicians in their little towns mm -hmm. and over the course of the next three years kind of gained the confidence to go and start playing my own music on the open mic circuit in liverpool which is a hard start i later realized you know i i threw myself in at the deep end because the scouts yeah. you know if they don't like your music they're going to let you know about it so i i i had to toughen up and practice and after a couple of months i you know i wasn't willing to walk out on a stage unless i had a couple of good put downs i could mm -hmm. deal with some heckling and and you know I, I had to be able to really play my ass off so oh so it wasn't even like people judging like oh you know some music theory thing like you shouldn't have put a chord that chord doesn't make sense there it's oh, more no, like no. people are like heckling you like oh when yeah you're performing? yeah wow oh, absolutely man you, you're playing to you know a, a, a liverpool pub at 11 in the evening you know that's those are the only you, you get these open mic slots where you know when you when you're starting out you just you, you don't have a chance of getting a proper gig so you're mm -hmm. going right into the bear pit and people if they don't like you for a second they'll just man you get <laughs> you get shouted at things thrown at you you know oh but fortunately i had you know i had a back then you know we're talking like 2003 when mm -hmm. i started gigging this is before the kind of uh the folk renaissance in the uk happened okay um and i was pioneering kind of acoustic music in that part of england that, that no one else was so it it was kind of interesting for people i think mm -hmm. which is why i i kind of fared i fared pretty well i didn't i didn't ever get shouted off a stage i only That's ever good. i only ever once walked off a stage to um have a fight with someone and that that only ever happened once <laughs> okay. which in in five years of of solidly gigging in liverpool i count that as a pretty pretty decent pretty score good one yeah. <laughs> so something but so a one time what happened like somebody's just heckling you too much you're like i'm done with oh, this yeah this guy just got on my nerves he <laughs> <laughs> can you swear on this podcast oh yeah of course oh yeah just this this lad just went your shit and i just i put my guitar down i went you know what <laughs> I, just, I, wait, <laughs> I waited in but we it was it was in a in a club where actually i'd um i'd already sold the place out a couple of times and the bouncers knew me and we we got on so the bouncers waded into and this guy was gone oh wow <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean those were different days you know that's, sure that's, that's a while ago now <laughs> wow okay so <laughs> did you did you end up finishing school at the at the institute or at the university yeah, yeah okay yeah. And, and then i went into two years straight of um working part-time at various jobs and mm -hmm. playing open mics playing okay playing gigs you know i i my, i had a, a a period there where i was working in a bar five nights a week um an indian supermarket at weekends a comic book shop uh i was working mornings in a cafe and and then late evenings i was working as a car park attendant up at the liverpool wow. Philharmon at the liverpool philharmonic hall i had all of these sort of various um part-time and cash in hand jobs and and then whenever i could i was playing restaurant sets playing dinner music for people mm -hmm. in kind of upmarket quite posh restaurants where people were you know people would be eating their scallops and their lobster and i would be just kind of noodling away playing <laughs> moon, moon river on an acoustic guitar okay and, get, and getting cash in hand and kind of learning what people dug you know I, and i was really studying the great instrumental acoustic guitarists of the time eric roche and you know like every other acoustic guitar player i'd, I'd fallen head over heels for my michael hedges and kelly joe phelps mm -hmm. and nick drake and you know, I found that actually playing a really kind of banging solo version of, uh, what was it? I heard it through the grapevine um, that Eric Roche used to play. If I if I hit that, then that got a much bigger response than trying to play, um, you know, a little classical piece or, mm -hmm. um, or Moon River or whatever. And people started paying attention to that. So I started kind of getting an idea of what worked in a set. And that, you know being background music weirdly informed um my sets of my songs which i was kind of you know tentatively getting into i had four or five songs that i felt were okay uh-huh um 
and so I decided, yeah, actually, no, I'll, I'll make a go of this song thing instead because I was kind of getting more out of that, more more out of playing original music. Um, and when I did that, I I qu- quite quickly wrote my first record. Um, I just didn't have the money to produce it, you know. Okay. So I, my flatmate had a he had a Mac, uh, you know, the big old Apple Mac plastic tower things oh that, right yeah back then were like the cutting edge and now sure. they, they, they kind of look like bollards you know um and <laughs> we were producing cds he was my bass player as well and we were recording on a friend's eight track cutting it to cd and then printing them on this mac and selling them at gigs and you know it was a good time man i was flying by the seat of my pants i was broke all the time but the only thing i cared about was music and paying the rent and so, you know, I was taking every gig I could. And one night I played a, uh, I played in the lobby of one of the big art centers in Liverpool. The guy upstairs was playing a Songs of Nick Drake concert. And I just played my own songs downstairs. And this, this guy walks up to me and he says, uh, what are you doing a week Saturday? And I said, I'm, oh, I think I've got a, I'm playing down at the Jacaranda on Seal Street, you know, playing an open mic. He said, well, what if you, pull out of that and come and open for john martin wow and i said well <laughs> the, only thing, <laughs> the only thing you can say is yes please You're right so i uh you know my first experience of dealing with a music industry agent and taking a proper booking and i just wow i said yes absolutely um i got my mate to drive me down i took you know a carrier bag i, I thought i'll be ambitious i took 50 cds that i printed Mm-hmm. On my mate, on my mate Harry's Mac, and I sold them all in two minutes after the gig. Whoa! Yeah, and and John Martin asked me to go on tour with him. So the, <laughs> the, the cash that I made from that bag of CDs, I I went straight into a studio, and I made my first record for about three hundred quid. What did you re-record that one, or you put? Is that when you put out? Um, yeah, your, that was the fo- that was the Fox the map and direction. Okay, so that was the that one. Okay. Yeah, it, sorry, that one was reprinted later after Map or Direction. Got so it. In, okay. In two thousand six, I I put out the Fox and the Monk by myself. Uh huh. And I went and sold it on tour with John. And, Whoa. And started making a living, but my first real paycheck, weirdly, you know. I was still working part time in between this. I, I was offered a gig at the Ullapool Guitar Festival up in the Highlands of Scotland. In, mm-hmm. So actually, I'm, I'm getting my order of things wrong. I'm backtracking here. Before <laughs> the John Martin thing, I was offered this guitar festival, and I sent this. I sent this handmade CD, and and they invited me up there, and they paid me more than I was earning from my various part time jobs. Wow! So I went. I took that check, I put it in the bank, and I immediately signed up to become self-employed. And then for the next nine months, I was flat broke. <laughs> back in back in Liverpool, I couldn't get any proper gigs. I was just so, I was so excited by the um, the momentum that this guitar sure. festival gave me. You know, Richard paid me proper money for it, and I no one knew who I was. Uh-huh. So then I was broke, and then the John Martin thing came around, and yeah, producing it my own cd and then selling it you know we were playing big rooms man like two thousand people a night yeah this is back in the days where you could walk off stage and sell 150 cds wow you know cash in hand so i i suddenly could afford to learn how to drive and buy another guitar and you know Mm -hmm. move into a decent place and all this stuff so that I, i started kind of getting on my way towards being a functional member of society as well as actually playing gigs you know it was pretty amazing uh-huh. yeah it was wow fun. so from from that john martin tour that's when you started gaining kind of a fan base for yourself too i'm I would imagine yeah. and yeah, then we, absolutely okay yeah and from from there like okay now you just did this tour you you have some momentum then what do you what, what's the next what's the next step like how did you keep going well i found that every festival promoter i spoke to on the back of the john martin gigs would book me because i was opening for john and you know I, and it was John's um, endorsement, you know, there was, there was mm-hmm. sort of credibility kind of there. Co-signed for you, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. He was very kind to me, man. Um, so I just started getting festival gigs and then, you know, things snowballed for a couple of years. And 
I I was getting more and more support acts with different people. I went and opened for John Remborn and Davy Graham. Uh, Deacon Blue, man. I noticed that you interviewed Ricky. Yeah. On this podcast. And yeah, yeah, yeah. What, I love what that. Legend. What yeah, legend. he's such a cool guy. Yeah, I played my... The biggest show I'd ever played at that point was opening for Deacon Blue at the Echo Arena in Liverpool. Really? Yeah, and Rick, I remember Ricky coming up to me, and he was just so kind to me. He was so he's sweet, so sweet. Yeah, I, yeah. I was, I didn't know. I'm like, this guy, like you said, he's a legend. I'm like, sometimes Big it's time. like, are they gonna be nice to me? <laughs> like, <laughs> or, and he was so cool, such a great guy. Really nice, yeah. That's so the, awesome. all these, all these opportunities came back on, came up on the back of opening for John, and then, yeah. you know, pretty soon the uh industry as it were started taking notice so you know labels were coming to see me play and all that kind of attendant nonsense of of people saying oh you know let's come and see you and we'll have dinner and then you just don't hear from them Mm -hmm. but uh, a music manager got in touch and said you know i see what you're up to should we have a chat and i signed up with a with a company that i was with then for the next 10 years and we made a few records together you know we made map or direction mm-hmm. and I, I flew off to the the deep south and you know we drove around me and my producer jason boss off from south america uh, south africa mm-hmm. we we drove around i'm saying i'm saying the south so many times i'm getting my continents confused <laughs> so jason is from south africa okay and he and i drove to north america to drive around the deep south of north america uh, so like south of the, in the states like yeah, alabama we, okay we landed in dallas and we we took in austin um natchez mississippi and new orleans louisiana and we we did a little tour just recording out the back of this rented sort of monstrosity kind of chevrolet you know eight ton car thing you know, the, you know the massive cars that you have yeah. in, in america texas is full of them we just got one in <laughs> okay thought, yeah. okay we'll put we'll chuck a guitar and a banjo in and we'll open the boot and we'll we'll just record as we go so we recorded under bridges and wow you know, in, in ghost towns and in abandoned churches and made this little record um that kind of it didn't do much but it just it was just a great time and the songs were you know i loved them at the time and it all felt like a like a you know an enjoyable kind of um adventure yeah then, was that what record was that was that map and direction that was, or map that was or map, direction map, map or direction. direction wow oh, i didn't but realize then, it so that whole record was recorded in various places in the south yeah 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 whoa and i kind of continued to tour in the uk just relentlessly taking every gig i could and then you know, over the course of that four years, I I gathered the songs for Great Lakes, and in two thousand and thirteen, I released Great Lakes, which kind of changed my life. You know that that record got on the radio in mm-hmm. the UK, and uh, and it just sort of put me in a completely different place. You know, I, yeah, I, I sort of went from being obscure to actually um, playing to you know quite a few people not 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 huge audiences but playing to enough that I, that it would sort of take my breath away you know sure a thousand people in a room and that and when they're all quiet is feels like a pretty big deal when you're on stage you know yeah um, and it's your show at that point right i mean you said yeah. that your first kind of tour with with john martin you were playing 2000 seaters but everyone's kind of you're you're the opener guy yeah now you're yeah, the yeah. you're the headliner playing to a thousand people that are all there to see you that must have been quite a feeling it took a minute to get my head around it for sure yeah yeah it, was, wow. it felt like it felt like a big responsibility but mm-hmm. you know i dug it it was it was a really it's it's always an honor you know and, and that so that sort of that was a big learning curve and a, and a period of sort of gaining confidence mm-hmm. um, well, but it went, getting a know, song on the radio like how how did that how, like did you know because you at this point you still you had a manager right but you didn't have a yeah. record label no, we we just we're kind of doing it ourselves, self-releasing. Yeah, and how so, does a a record? How does the radio station get a hold of it and start playing it? I think you give two grand to a radio plugger, and and they go and work. Really like hard. oh, they try to work the record. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I th- I just think we found the best plugger that we could. Fuzz Chowdhury, <laughs> who, who um I think she now works for Concord. Okay, think, yeah. Anyway, she's 
She's amazing. Was the orchard? Wasn't it orchard at one point, or maybe not? Yeah, I don't know, man. But fuzz. or that's red. I don't know. They all get kind of blended into me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it all turns into a big kind of soup. But fuzz is what <laughs> she was one of a kind, and she was camped out in the in BBC, you know, in in the lobby, just shouting at people about this record. <laughs> And it worked, man. We got on the radio, and um, that was you know, that's huge. Do you remember hearing it on the radio the first time? Did you know it was coming up? Like, yeah, tell yeah. me about that I, moment. I remember my mum phoning me and and saying that she'd heard Great Lakes on the radio, and uh, yeah, she was completely blown away. You know, mm -hmm. it's a it's a surreal experience. You get used to it very quickly, and and worse yet, you start taking it for granted. And then as soon as you start taking it for granted, it goes away. Mm -hmm. And then you then you kind of fucked because you, you realize that you you shouldn't have um, <laughs> you, took it for granted. <laughs> you shouldn't have taken it for granted at all. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious, yeah. uh, like how how you know your dad worked in the industry for such a long time. Like how did he feel about you you doing like you know taking that step to wanting to be a, a musician? Was he you know supportive yeah. of that or was he, he kind of like he was fine? Okay, was I didn't fine, know if yeah. he was like I've seen this you know. It happened to you know this no, horror no. story a million times or or whatever no, i mean he was just in distribution man he 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 didn't have any um any horror stories apart from just uh the, the one with his finding partner. people finding people to trust yeah gotcha okay so, I but I, I remember saying to my dad <laughs> look I, I i don't i don't really know what I, I don't think i want to do anything conventional i think i just want to be a musician and he and he i remember you know i was maybe 18 and i remember him buying a four pack of beer and taking me out in the car. So I knew it was serious. Okay. <laughs> and we sat, we sat down up on Berry head, you know, up, up on the, up on the cliffs. And he said, look, son, just do what you want as long as you're happy. And I'm forever grateful for that. That's amazing. That I know, is amazing. I, Cause I, I think, you know, there's, there's not much I could more I could have asked for in life. Yeah. Right? There's so many situations that people have where it's like, no, you will not, you know, they're not, you know, you're cheer. Yeah. They're, you're, Somebody that's really pioneering for you. It's yeah, I was lucky, man. Very fortunate. I think it's just as well because I took one look at the world of sort of corporate structure and I thought, nah, man, that, that's, <laughs> that's not for me. No, thank you. Yeah, so I'm glad. Totally. I'm glad that I'm glad that my dad, uh, you know, g'd me on. Mm -hmm. That's anyway, awesome. I, you know, Great Lakes was going well, and I got a call from David Gray, the great singer songwriter, mm -hmm. who asked if I would go and. Uh, do some backing vocals and guitar for this new project. Wow. So I went and played on his record and went on tour with him for a couple of years. And that's how I kind of got started in America, you know. Wow. Playing, opening for Dave in in venues like, you know, Radio City and <laughs> the Ryman and, you know, all of these extraordinary opportunities. So sure. another case of someone just, you know, willing to take a chance on mm -hmm. on, on what I did and lending me a platform um and after that you know i went and made a, another record i made headlong uh -huh. um which was a more commercial record and that was that was another sort of life changer you know it, it was weird six months after headlong my management team disbanded so i was sort of left floating as it were oh kind of without a without a home a home yeah but how, then how well, you that record did so well. I mean, or, yeah, you have a song on Spotify that the you know far too good is thirty three million plays. Yeah, that started happening <laughs> man, right, like right around the time that every like my whole team collapsed and my agent left and everything went really south. Mm -hmm. And then Spotify started happening, okay. and and then I went and found a new team. I went to Folk Alliance in Kansas City just with an open mind and a and a really open heart mm -hmm. and just just to see what was out there and that's where I played guitar to maybe five people in a in a little hotel room at, at this strange music industry conference and then Dave Macias of 30 Tigers comes up to me and starts talking to me about um units and collateral as though we've already signed a deal <laughs> and the next day <laughs> You know, we had breakfast and I was a th I was a client of 30 Tigers and I had some drinks with um, this amazing playlister from Spotify who uh, uh, a lady called Meg Tarquinio who explained to me actually sort of the ethos behind creative playlisting which kind of shifted my 
career focus it made me realize that actually maybe i don't need to go and slog my guts out for 200 days a year on the road Mm -hmm. got me really interested in in actually becoming a part of the um the streaming system you know (laughs) because actually when it's done right you can actually reach people who would otherwise not hear your music at all Mm -hmm. so things started happening man on the streaming services and uh and i kind of almost through through no um no you know no uh steering of my own intent landed on my feet having, yeah having felt the rug pulled out from under me um uh, i'm not sure i combined the right uh that, I don't know if that was the right combination of metaphors, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, I get I, it. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. thrown up in the air and I landed like a cat. Right, by, right. By exactly. sheer chance. You, 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 you know, everything kind of crumbled as far as management went, but you had <laughs> you had the record and the songs. I had so it didn't of, it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I, I had this song that started to actually make, you know, get me real exposure and and make me some money, which had never happened before. Mm-hmm. So. I thought that probably the smart move was to make a really obscure folk record. So <laughs> I went off I went off and made Hummingbird. Yeah. Which you know, which was great fun. And um and that brings me to now, you know, I Yeah. So you, you put out Hummingbird and were you able to tour the I mean that record came out what, two thousand eighteen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were able to, to tour it and everything before the world kinda came to a halt, right? Yeah, I toured it hard, man. Like mm-hmm. two thousand eighteen and nineteen I was away. Well, what year is it now? 21, 20. Yeah, 18 and <laughs> We 19. like lost the whole year. So <laughs> I, <ain't gonna> <laughs> I have to, I have to, I have, sometimes have to look at my diary to remember what year it is. Right. At the minute, you know, it's been such a strange time. But I, yeah, like 19, 18 and 19, I played 150 shows each year. Whoa. Um, and that was just through sheer bloody mindedness. You know, I've made a folk record. I bloody well want people to hear it. Mm-hmm. So I went and pl- I'd said yes to everything and I worked my tits off. And I was exhausted at the end of it. <laughs> like I, I realized I'd taken too much on, and mm-hmm. I, I went and recorded this song called "Burden of the Road," which was basically about taking my foot off the gas and wanting to be at home for the first time ever. Because you know, I've got a young daughter. Um, I've got this feeling now that actually every moment with her is precious. I wrote a song about it, and then, you know, less than a year after releasing that track, the world stops. And I'm at sure. Home. <laughs> and then, yeah. So wow. Okay. So, Burn of the Road came out uh, as just like a single prior, you know, after Hummingbird. Yeah. Yeah. Mid 2019. Okay. okay. Yeah. And how, I mean, how, you're touring constantly as far as shows go, 150 mm-hmm. shows. And then, where are you when, when everything stops? Are you at home at this point or were you like uh, on the road? And tell me about how that all, I mean, that must have really affected your. Your, you know how you, how you usually <laughs> operate right <laughs> yeah i was in sydney man oh and man I, and i just played to two thousand people in port elliot no port ferry beg your pardon port ferry down in um right in the south of australia like about an hour's train ride from melbourne you get off in in the middle of what feels like the middle of nowhere and someone picks you up in a van <laughs> and takes you to paradise which is 10 minutes down the road <laughs> and, and it's called Port Fairy Folk Festival. Okay. And I played a couple of the most enjoyable gigs of my life. I've been working in Australia really hard for a few years. Mm-hmm. And I play this gig that is just, it's one of those sort of extraordinary moments where everything falls into place and the crowd is tuned in and the sound is great and I'm playing well. The jet lag's worn off and it connects. And it was, you know, one of those, you know, once a year moments where you are completely in the flow and a couple of nights later i go to bed at a hotel in sydney i'm expecting to wake up and drive down to another festival i'm feeling really high i'm on a roll Mm -hmm. and i get a text saying the festival's been cancelled someone in that town has got this this coronavirus (laughs) you know in in quotation marks in the text because no one really knew what it was what it was right And and i think well my mate jimmy lives down on bondi I could go and maybe spend a week down there writing. And then the whole state of Victoria is shut down. They announce it's going to be shut in 24 hours. So I get 
on the internet and I see that there's a flight home <laughs> and it's somehow it's 500 quid and I think I'm going to I'm just going to have to do it. I call my wife, she says, "You know what? I've been watching the news. Things are starting to get a bit weird. I think you should right. come home." Uh-huh. And, and my wife never. She's I'm very very fortunate to be married to a lady who who doesn't tell me what to do where work is concerned. She mm-hmm. doesn't say you know, when are you going to be home? How how late are you staying out? When are you going to, when are you starting to drive? I don't get any of that. But on this occasion, she says, I think you should come home, darling. And I, yeah, I go, okay, this, this you know, it's serious, be, right? This is serious, right? Right. Yeah. If, if she's, if she's feeling that way and I, I look at the flights, I get on a plane and airport land is dead. You know, there's no one around. Yeah, it must have been weird. Spooky, man. Were people wearing masks yet, or was it just like no, kind of but staying be- away from each other? And well, I flew through Singapore, so everyone wears a mask in Singapore anyway. Oh, okay. Apart from um, the Westerners, who, to whom wearing a mask is this sort of alien concept. And <laughs> right. you know, look where we are now. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I should have been wearing a mask in airports this whole time. Right. Um, but yeah, I get I get home, and then you know, my next gig is a. My first headline tour of America, which was scheduled for April last year, which again I've been working up to for like five, six years. Mm-hmm. Finally got a visa that allowed me to go and headline, and that's pulled. And then <sighs> everything, all the festival shows, everything mm-hmm. pulled, gone. So, yeah, like everyone else, I was left in my house, scratching my head, going, "What? What? What? <laughs> What's mm-hmm. going on?" Right. You know. And how quickly do you get inspiration to to put together this new record? Like, were you sitting around for a while, kind of trying to watch, figure out what's going on? I mean, you you have a headlining tour ready to go, and mm-hmm. now you're just kind of waiting. When do you start working on the new record? Well, to be honest, I I just took a minute to grieve for the, for the for the work and for the tour and for the mm-hmm. for that little part of my life that affords me some space and time mm-hmm. very it's very self-indulgent being a touring musician man you have to understand we're not we're not necessarily in it for the transcendent beauty of communicating with an audience sometimes we're in it just for you know having a minute to ourselves on the train or a plane to read a book sure <laughs> you know, we are we are weak and um self-indulgent animals who can't necessarily uh, tolerate the rigors of domestic life you know <laughs> sure. so, so i'm at home with a three-year-old who is looking at me for answers uh-huh. but i ha- i have none i i've never had any answers really i barely <laughs> have i barely have any opinions i just i know about playing guitar and writing songs uh-huh. so suddenly she's here i know that i have to provide and that i've just lost a lot of money mm-hmm. and so i think well okay well I've got a recording of a gig, my last gig in the UK. So I put that out as a live mm-hmm. album. I, I felt very strongly that people were missing the communion of of the live experience. I put out this live record and I played a bunch of gigs around it. You know, these kind of world tours. You build them as world tours, but really you're, you're playing in your house. And oh, people, you did. Okay. like Just the, tune in in different times. Yeah. Just, yeah. Like the live stream yeah. events. Yeah. Like, okay. Like the, you, you know, I thought I was being clever at the time. You know, myself and my team were the first people that we knew of to do this. And then we got wind of, you know, Joe Pug and all of these other clever people who've who've done loads of this stuff. <laughs> and we uh, we played. You know, I played. My team put it together with me, and I figured out how to play into a webcam via a mixing desk. And I played, you know, half a dozen shows. And had great crack, sold a bunch of CDs of this live album. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, a little water there. <laughs> and uh, and then, man, the night of the last show, um, my wife went into hospital. Oh my gosh! Yeah, we we uh, we had some serious health issues, and she was in hospital for a week, and I wasn't allowed to visit. You know. They came. Oh my! I didn't even think about that part. Oh my gosh! Yeah, because of the whole the virus, they weren't letting anybody in. Yeah, yeah. So she's, she's, you know, on on death's door in our bathroom, and she's tough, man. She's a North Walian. She's from North Wales, right? Okay. And she's a tough little lady, 
And she said, no, I don't. Ah, no, don't, ah, don't call an ambulance. Ah, I like, yeah. oh, baby, I'm calling an ambulance. No, don't, ah, you know. <laughs> so they come and they get her and say, okay, you're, you know, you're going to die if we don't take you in. Oh so, my gosh. so she's gone for a week and my whole world goes upside down, you know. Mm-hmm. So we, <laughs> you know, we concentrate on recovery. We lost a, we lost a pregnancy basically. Oh my and, gosh, I'm so sorry. Oh man, you know, it's it's real life, isn't it? You know, these things mm-hmm. happen. And in that same month, my mum calls me to tell me she's got cancer. So <sighs> it's a heavy month, man. You know, yeah. March and April last year were, were a real bastard. And the only way that I could cope and process these things, aside from concentrating wholeheartedly on my girls, was to write songs. You know, I I picked up a pen and did my best to kind of sort my head out because otherwise I was going to collapse. Yeah. Oh and gosh. and I wrote these songs, you know, and I found that the songs kept coming. And in any writing process, you write a load of crap and you also write a few good things. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it went on like that. There was a bit of filtering out to be done, but I sort of emerged from this process with eight new songs and four that I had already started back in January I was doing a bit of co-writing I wrote one with a beautiful instinctive a songwriter and producer called Jonathan Quornby and another lovely fella called Paul Usher mm-hmm. and uh, the great Dennis Ellsworth from Prince Edward Island and, a, and this amazing writer in she's in Asheville called Sarah Siskind who is a prolific writer she wrote all the hits on that program Nashville Oh wow! And we have we have mutual friends, and I stopped by to see her. This is back in the summer of 2019. I was driving from uh, I was driving back to Nashville mm-hmm. from from Atlanta or somewhere, and I took a dog leg and went to see Sarah down in Asheville, and and we spent a day writing. And I wrote this song "Eye to Eye," and as soon as I wrote it, I thought, God, I'd love to hear Sarah Jarose on this, and mm-hmm. that stayed in the back of my mind. When we got to the pre-production for this album, I had written these songs and I'd thought of people that I really wanted to feature because I hadn't seen my mates for a while. You know, you bump into your friends at gigs Mm -hmm. and you have a bit of crack and maybe you sing together on the stage. And, you know, it's it's like working in the same office building, you know. Mm -hmm. bump into the elevators and take the piss out of each other and off you go about your day, you know. (laughs) Sure. And I hadn't seen the Milk Carton Kids for ages. Sarah Jarose, Courtney Hartman, you know, Lisa Hannigan, my, my big sister over in Dublin. I hadn't seen her for ages and I thought, God, it'd be lovely to get these, all these people on songs. So that started to really influence the course of this album. Okay. I I got my friend and, and mentor, Joe Henry, who, if your listeners don't know Joe, he's one of the great living American songwriters. Just a master writer, you know. Mm-hmm. And I've been very fortunate to... to um dip my toe in his slipstream and you know play on his projects and be be a part of his world and he introduced me to bill frizzell who is my hero okay and bill said yes when i asked him to play on a song wow yeah so i had this stellar cast lined up you know of of tremendous musicians you know Mm -hmm. it's the first time i've allowed another guitar player to play on my record i got bill oh wow and i got kenny kenny pattengale you know who's a really good friend but also Jesus, you know, what a great guitar player. <laughs> you know, he's he's the lead in the Milk Carton Kids. Oh, okay. And so, you know, when we went in to record this album, I was sending rough mixes out to all of these people. They were recording their bits and sending them back to me. And I was allowing their, very consciously wanted their parts to steer the ship so that I would bounce off it and record the next thing with them in mind, like you would in a live session, you know? Mm-hmm. So though they were recording remotely, kind of like you're in your room there with a decent microphone, you know, mm-hmm. all, all these people have got this kind of setup at home. So they were recording good audio, sending it to me and I was feeding it into the system and, oh, and okay, just, just letting it be a kind of collaborative experience. So it was, it was all a, done, like their parts were all done virtually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wow. recording it in their, in their bedrooms or in their home studios or whatever. And that's what will be on the record? That's on the record, yeah. Oh, like, wow. I had Shani Gandhi in Nashville mix the record and, and she was great at just fielding all of these various 
elements and doing her magic, making them all sound cohesive. You know, with, mm-hmm. with Bill, with Bill's guitar, I played it into the room at Real World. And yeah, I was going to say, didn't you re- record the record at Real? You record at Peter Gabriel's studio, right? Yeah. So was that just your parts and then everybody else's kind of... Me, yeah, the bass, the the horns and the piano mm-hmm. and the, all, all my vocals and Jess, uh, Jessica Stavely taylor of, of the Staves, who mm-hmm. you probably know, she came down from London and sang on the record. And then, yeah, I, I was bringing in virtual parts from... Oh, US, okay. Yeah, I was, I was wondering yeah. about because in the in the little trailer video you put out, it's all like you know live footage from the studio. So I wasn't sure yeah. how if you flew the if you know especially with the regulations on everything, <laughs> like how, how that all kind of came together. But yeah, we just did it virtually, as it were. That's amazing. Had people record in their in their own setups and send me the the WAV files, and mm-hmm. then we'd fold them into Pro Tools, you know, which is the computer program that. Uh-huh that this studio was using it to enable us to you know sequence all the audio and uh and it all kind of came together like that it was like a really kind of fun lego puzzle Mm -hmm. um i've probably jumped ahead a couple of steps but yeah here we are in the in the middle of the making of this record and now that it's mixed you know it sounds as intended it sounds collaborative you know that's amazing that's amazing doing but it it kind of worked i was i was so pleased when it worked so that so those songs were the ones that you had kind of written right after, you know, everything that you said, April, March, April. Yeah. You wrote those songs and you were able to show them it by just what demos and sending them out via mm. you know, the internet or how, how, how did you get everybody on board as far as like their parts? Well, with, you know, with the singers, with Sarah and Courtney and Lisa, I, I just said, look, I know you're probably busy. Um, and you, you know, we're talking about world class female singers, right? You know? Right. <laughs> like, how would you feel about doing this? And it turns out everyone's sitting at home looking for things to do. It's like, yeah, sure, man. Okay. Um, Kenny and Joey, you know, we, I, I just said, lads, do you want to sing on this? And because they, you know, there's, there's just this kind of, you know, when you're mates with someone, you just say, yeah, sure. You know, I, mm-hmm. I was just like, lads, do you want to do this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> And then Bill, you know, it was like, "Excuse me, sir, <laughs> would you I'm like a big to fan. do this?" Yeah, <laughs> I sent him the demo, and he he wrote back like, "Oh man, I would love to do that." And it, he sent me eight different audio parts. Wow, and, different iterations of of this um, of Bill Frizzell playing on this song, and it, and they were all beautiful. I had this amazing evening where I was just listening to which which which. Uh, version of bill frizzell do i want on this song you know <laughs> right the more right. the more kind of angular unhinged version or the the really sweet jazz you know kind of cigar smoke version <laughs> and in the end we we chopped two of them up and put them together and i yeah i got bill frizzell on my record man that's amazing that's amazing yeah. And are you gonna how like aside from you know interviews and stuff to promote the album obviously touring isn't quite opened up yet but Mm. are you going to do another like virtual like play the record virtually or what do you think as far as that goes well i'm playing a a sort of high quality live stream ticketed event through mandolin.com who are they're kind of the the sort of standard in the u.s for putting these shows on Mm -hmm. um and they do a really nice job so i'm I've got some friends in Sheffield in in England filming me playing a live gig. We're going to stream it around the world. Wow. And then, and then I've put together all these pre-order packages. People can, you know, book a guitar lesson or a private show or whatever they want. Because, um, you know, making records is expensive. I've got to make some of that money back. And also mm-hmm. it's a nice way, crucially, I should say, it's a nice way to engage with people because without live gigs on the map for another six months, you know, it's it's nice actually just to be able to, have some kind of engagement with people over mm-hmm. even if it's over a webcam and a microphone but come september i'll be going on tour man i've announced um i've announced a tour in the uk which was a surreal experience yeah after, after a year you know after a year i mean people are just itching to get out I'm, i yeah. guarantee it so that's gonna be what a moment when you get to be on stage again for the first time in a year plus to perform to people i'm sure that's gonna be 
quite an emotional night. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm going to shit myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was talking to somebody earlier there like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of worried because I'm going to be like, ru- you know, rusty or am I, am I going to be able to know how to engage with the with the crowd at all at this point, you know. I'll be Everyone... I'll be amazed if I can hold a guitar without shaking. <laughs> you know, yeah. stage fright I I I got over that a long time ago, but I haven't been on stage for a year, you know. So, yeah. we'll see. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait till everything opens up. And <laughs> yeah, um, me too, man. I, the record, I love the songs that you've put out so far. I can't wait to hear the the, the rest of it. So, Thanks, um, man. yeah, very exciting. And thank you so much for doing this. It's been great. Yeah. I loved having you on. This is so much fun. Um, That's a pleasure. I, have, I have one more question for you. Okay. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know it's a weird time now to, yeah. <laughs> to give advice, but go go to dental school, <laughs> uh, <laughs> become a drug dealer. There's more money in it. <laughs> sure, um, or do both. You know, make a killing. <laughs> I I think just the what you know the world has changed, the industry has changed, and the landscape has changed in innumerable ways since I came up. You know, you have to be really good at social media you have to be able to market yourself but i think that the basic core truth of performance will never change is that you have to be good at what you do you have to practice really hard and you have to get yourself out of bed every day and if you're not willing to do those things you won't get anywhere i love that work hard work as hard as you can and when you're miserable from the night before and when you feel like jacking it in, go and get another gig. And when you play that gig and it sounds terrible and the feedback from the monitor, from the sound engineer who doesn't care about you and doesn't want to help you, splits your ears and you lose the top frequency of your hearing and you get heckled off stage and you get splashed by a taxi on the way out of the venue and you drop your wallet down the drain and you go home and you cry your eyes out and you get up the next day, go and get another gig. And stop messing around. Get another gig. Work harder. It's the only way. And it's, um, you know, it's it's the only advice I can give. It's I'm still learning, and I I'm nowhere near as successful or you know or as <laughs> as as I don't have any of the trappings of of uh, success that I imagined I would when I started out, but. You come to realize that none of that matters. the the real um, the real sort of the source of fortune in my life, aside from my family, is the fact that I can play gigs and make records and pay my bills, mm-hmm. and I can continue to do that. It looks like I can do that for another few years, you know, and then I'll make another record. And hopefully I'll get to do it for a few more years after that. You don't get in this game for long-term plans and there's no health insurance and there's no pension, you know, and you, you have to talk yourself out of bed some days and it's, it's not easy, but you know, it's, uh, hey man, it, you know, beats working for a living. I think <laughs> it beats working for someone else. Bring me the bad word.